Um, I'm also, uh, did you all hear that, that the recording is in progress? <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, once again, Farouz, thank you so much for the kind invitation. And uh, I'm, I'm delighted to have the opportunity. I hope I can uh, uh, rise to your, your expectations. You know, I want to thank uh, Mr. Dorai for that lovely prayer. You know, isn't it interesting how you can sense a pure heart, even though you don't understand a single word uh, of, of what is being said. You know, this was said of Abdul Baha when he gave talks. Uh, uh, he he would speak in in Farsi, and there was a story of him in New York where he was giving a talk in a church, and uh, um, somebody in the audience um, uh, poked somebody else and started talking, and he said, "Be quiet! I I I, I don't want to miss anything." And the person said, but he's speaking Farsi. And he said, no. and it sort of occurred to him that, oh my God, I don't even understand what the language is, but I feel everything he's saying. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? So we're, we, we have these connections, don't we? We have this, this uh, capacity to perceive uh, deeply and sometimes with the heart and sometimes without words even, parts of our reality, parts of what it means to be human, that, some, that not sometimes, but often we overlook. <clears throat> and I'm gonna kind of use that as a bit of a segue into uh, the time we're in and, uh, and the talk itself. The, uh, we're in a wonderful time. This is the festival of Rizwan to Baha'is, the festival of paradise. And it celebrates the idea that humanity moved into a new era in the 1860s with the with the declaration of Baha'u'llah and uh, introducing the idea that we're really all one human family and all of the isms that divide us are really uh, th th that which is dividing and uh, um, uh, uh, causing all the conflict in the time we're in. But the reality is we're one human family. And the, these days of paradise uh, uh, are really calling us to this notion that we're, we're all one. We're all in this together. There is no them. There is only us. So and as, as we speak, as we gather together virtually, right now in the Holy Land, uh, in uh, Haifa, Israel, there are representatives from every country of the world, every tribe, every ethnic organization, people from every imaginable background, gathering together at the Baha'i World Center for a, 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 a global conference to talk about how we move the world into um, its destined peace and how do we move out of the conflict and turmoil of this time into uh, something much nobler. So, uh, and that is going to be accompanied with the election of a body called the Universal House of Justice. So as we speak, those events are going on right now. So I wanted to talk about several paradoxes about life and life now. You know, as a psychiatrist, uh, I, I spend 10, 12 hours a day listening to the, the, the stories of individuals who are struggling mightily with all manner of, of problems that these times present, whether it's sexual violence or physical violence or uh, abuse of one form or another, or you know, um, as Farouz mentioned, I, my practice is in Newtown, Connecticut, where the horrific school shooting happened. So uh, here it is 10 years later, and there isn't a day that goes by that I don't speak to someone who wasn't personally directly involved with that tragedy and still suffering with the consequences of it. So the, you don't have to go far to find suffering and you don't have to go far to find um, uh, uh, people experiencing huge doubt and anxiety about the times that we're in. Um, so I wanted to offer some thoughts about a way to think about anxiety, and um, in particular, anxiety and fear, and um, maybe through a, a lens that we typically don't use. Um, you know, I, 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 I'm sort of a geography nut, uh, and um, I was on YouTube the other day looking at maps, and because that's what I, you know, most people have a hobby. I, I do nerdy things like that. So I was looking 
um, at different depictions of the globe. You know, you have a, a round surface that is portrayed on a, a flat surface. So there's no way to do that accurately. It, you're always uh, compromising something in representing a round surface, a round globe on a flat surface. So th there's over 200 different ways in which the, the globe is represented in two dimensions. So there's this phrase that captures that idea that the map is not the terrain. The, the map is only a representation of the terrain, uh, one way of looking at, let's say, Canada or Newtown, Connecticut or, or Malaysia. Um, so in a similar way, the word anxiety is a, it comes from a certain kind of map, a mental map about what human nature is. And it, it, the word anxiety describes a certain perspective on what a human being is. There are a lot of assumptions about what a human is when we use that word. And so I want to just shift the focus a little bit and offer maybe another way to think about anxiety uh, that might open up to us um, some healthier opportunities for our own growth and the growth of those we love. So I think what I'll do is I will start with a, a little bit of a discussion about how psychiatrists think about anxiety, that we, we think about the, the, everybody's heard of the fight or flight syndrome, right? Where the, the you know, you walk into the street and you uh, mistakenly forget to look both ways and suddenly a car comes on upon you and you, you look up in, in a, uh, with, start, with a start and um, instantly your body gets flooded with adrenaline, right? And everybody's heard the story of when that happens, uh, the, that little old lady who was crossing the street and, you know, so was flooded with adrenaline. And when she saw a kid under a car and could lift the car and pull the kid out, I don't know, everybody's heard that story. Nobody knows if it ever actually happened, but, ev but everybody's heard the story. But the point being that we have this alarm system in, in, our, in, our, in our brain that goes off when we are threatened in some way. And that's called the fight or flight response where we are flooded with adrenaline to either fight the, the threat or to flee from it. Now there's a third one, freeze, but we won't talk about that just yet. Um, so this, this response is a wonderful and important thing to keep us alive if a lion is chasing us, let's say. Uh, we, need, uh, we have to be filled with energy to fight the thing or filled with energy to run from it. Right? And the accompanying emotions that go with that fighting or fleeing are anger or fear. Right? So one of the things that all the anger and fear in the world right now tell us is that everybody's in flight in a fight or flight mode right now because the world is unsafe or it feels unsafe it feels very uncertain and we feel powerless over so much of what's going on in the world and this this triggers our fight or flight response now that's even before we get to the people's individual experiences just the world in the state it's in right now is is uh, uh, causing people to feel defensive or aggressive so Psychiatrists and psychologists, we tend to look at anxiety <clears throat> as a form of fear. If you take away the lion, let's say that that's coming at you, but you keep all of the physical responses and the mental and, uh, and the emotional responses of a, a lion attacking you, but you get rid of the lion, that's anxiety. It's all the physical, emotional, and mental responses to a threat but the threat is perhaps ambiguous. You don't really know why you're anxious or you might not know why you're actually anxious. So this is, this is a way that psychiatrists, psychologists tend to think about anxiety. And then the ways that people intervene have to do with either changing the biochemistry of the brain so that it calms down or using various sorts of self-regulation techniques to calm down the brainstem, to calm down uh, that adrenaline response many, many, many ways. But I don't want to look at anxiety as a psychiatrist today. And I want to invite you to, to uh, follow me with a different line of thinking. <clears throat> and let me read something to you that I wrote, oh, a couple years ago about anxiety. <clears throat> and then we'll build on it 
on this uh, idea from there. And I wrote, what if what we call anxiety is mostly the natural yearning of the heart? It's a yearning to find how one fits in the wondrous beauty of life. It's a yearning to be a part of that flow of the infinite beauty and richness of life. It's a yearning to be seen as a part of that beauty, a yearning to add one's unique gifts to the unfoldment of that wondrous beauty, a yearning to join in the celebration of life's wonders. So if we feel that we're not a part of that flow of life, if we feel that somehow the wondrous beauty of life is beyond our reach or that it's you know, moving through our fingers or like the river of life is flowing by us, but somehow we're not in it, right? Or we're not good enough to be in it or, or somehow life hasn't embraced us. Uh, that is what generates the, uh, a sense of fear. But the underlying yearning is that we want to be a part of life, right? If you take an anxiety and just peel it back, you'll find a yearning for connection to life in some way. Just this morning <clears throat> with one of my patients, uh, uh, she was apologizing for being a little bit late uh, after coming miles and miles and miles, taking an Uber to see me through a pouring uh, rainstorm. And I, I said to her, well, you forgot that this is a no guilt zone. There, you, we don't do guilt in here. Um, but what you just told me by saying you're sorry and being anxious that you're late, what you just told me is that you're a really good person because you want to do the right thing. You have high standards. You want to be on time. You want to be present and responsible. And it, it worries you. you. You become anxious if you can't be responsible and uh, uh, in, engaged in this, this kind of work. So that tells me you're, you're a highly ethical person, a very responsible person, and you care about doing the right thing. <clears throat> she said, oh, well, thank you. Well, I said, well, I'm not trying to compliment. I guess I am trying to compliment you, but it's not intended to be just a compliment. But to see that what we're calling anxiety is really a, a, a way that we're expressing a yearning to be a part of life, to be connected to others in a responsible way, in an elevated way, in a way that is ethical, and uh, life affirming, right? So as a doctor, as a, as a psychiatrist, I view, I'm, I was trained to view anxiety as a pathology, right? But I'm now telling my patient, well, it's not a pathology, you're telling me you're a good person. So what, and good for you. Um, and then I said, you know, a sociopath wouldn't feel sorry. And they wouldn't be anxious. They'd say, "Well, the hell with you," I'm, you know, and, they, and they wouldn't care. Right? So you're not a sociopath, <clears throat> is what I told her. And then she laughed. And I said, "I'm not so sure about me, but I know you're not a sociopath." So, <clears throat> so the point of this is that there is this yearning in human hearts to be connected to the flow of life and to give to it and to receive from it, to have this sense of reciprocity, uh, that we have something to give to life and it gives us back, right? There's this flowing process of in, inward and outward. Um, and when that's frustrated in some way, we feel the, the yearning turns to anxiety, or if we don't know that's what we're really after, right? when it's simply a vague notion of yearn of anxiety, but we're not really sure why we're anxious. My take is, is that there's some yearning to be connected to the flow of life that hasn't been articulated and perhaps met yet, right? So <clears throat> see how that's kind of turning it on its side a little bit. We're not looking at the, this as a pathology, but we're looking at it as a natural yearning. Does that make sense? Okay, so now what does that have to do with a spiritual process? Well, let's let's define spiritual for a minute, if you don't mind. This is just me, um, and I'll refer to some Baha'i writings in a moment, but I've only been a, a Baha'i for 50 years, so I'm still working on it, and uh, I'm, I don't know that I have it down yet, but I'll give you just some, some thoughts that I have. Um, 
and that they're they're mine and, and they're and take them or leave them. Um, <clears throat> there's a few ways I can go at this point. So let's talk a little bit about why we would want to be connected to life in that way. What is it about our inner world that would want to be so connected? And what does that have to do with a spiritual process? <clears throat> I'm, I, I'm going to take the risk of saying that I, I don't think that a spiritual life has a lot to do with beliefs. <clears throat> I think that beliefs are really important and having a correct orientation of your thinking is great and, and, and can guide you through much of life. <clears throat> But what's more important is it's, it's something more fundamental that gets us to a place where we are aware that we want to be connected to the largest forces of life and to be giving to it and receiving from it. Now, this is okay. Um, I, <clears throat> see, I give this a version of this talk in a class I give that's you know, months long. And I just realized I was going down the path that we wouldn't be able to resolve for three months into the into the course. So I have to, so I have to, you know, back up a little bit and then and give the uh, the reader's digest condensed version for our, our time tonight. <clears throat> but uh, if you wouldn't mind, allow me to read some quotes from the Baha'i writings that I will help orient our thinking a little bit about what this yearning might be and, and what a spiritual process might be uh, to help us look at <clears throat> what we're, we've been calling anxiety, perhaps in a new way. There's this, there are these amazing and sometimes mysterious quotes from Baha'u'llah, who's the founder of the Baha'i faith, who, um, who uh, declared his spiritual mission exactly during this time in 1863 in Baghdad. So there, in one of his quotes, he says something kind of uh, amazing. And, and let me just read it to you. <clears throat> he says, the one true God, exalted be his glory, hath, with, has, hath wished <clears throat> nothing for himself. The allegiance of mankind profiteth him not, neither do, does its perversity harm him. He, he, then he goes on to say, the bird of the realm of utterance, what an amazing illusion voiceth continually this call. So this is God speaking to humanity, where he says, all things have I willed for thee, and thee too, for thine own sake. So in other words, the whole world, all of creation, uh, all things have I willed for thee, for us, for each one of us, and thee too, right? So there's again, this thing, this outer world and this inner world, <clears throat> and he's he's given all of this to us for our sake, not for his sake. He, he's the creator. He doesn't need anything. So it's I wanted to just present this idea that the life is a gift. All of life is a gift. Creation is a gift. And it's a gift to us. And, and the gift is not just all of the universe, but it's all of what is within us. So Baha'u'llah goes on to say, <clears throat> in many, many writings, I just picked a few here tonight, that the human inner reality contains within it infinite possibilities, infinite potential, that we're essentially, there, there's one quote where Baha'u'llah says, what? Think ye are a puny form when the universe is wrapped within you? So it's this idea that everything in the, in the creation is potentially knowable to us, right? And, and it's wrapped up within us. And he goes on to say, here's a, a, a phenomenal quote. He says, could ye apprehend with what wonders of my munificence and bounty I have willed to entrust your souls? Ye what of a truth rid yourselves of attachment to all created things and would gain a true knowledge of your own selves. A knowledge which is the same as the comprehension of mine own being. Isn't that astounding? So he's saying if we were to truly know ourselves, we would know not only, uh, not only the, you know, the 
infinite universe, but we would know the heart of God. Well, that's, that's uh, pretty amazing. So he likens these elements within us to gems in this wonderful quote where he says, regard man as a mine rich in gems of inestimable value. Regard man as a mine rich in gems of inestimable value. So I, I thought about that and I was thinking if I were standing on the a mountainside and really worried that I'm not a part of life, that somehow my actions or the actions of people around me have prevented me from feeling connected to all these wonderful gifts, I might not know that right beneath my feet, just a, a foot or two, is a strain of gold or is a, a, a strain of diamonds right beneath my feet. So the first thing is to know that these gems are within us, right? Regard man as a mind rich in gems of inestimable value. Because then he goes on and says, Edu education alone cause it to reveal its treasures and enable mankind to benefit therefrom. So what kind of education? An education that lets us know that we have this infinite capacity and we're always connected to the infinity of life. There's nothing we can do to extract ourselves from this river of life that I referred to a minute ago. But then why do we feel so often disconnected? Why do we feel as though we're forlorn, that life doesn't recognize anything about us, that, that we feel completely out of the river of life, and that we have nothing to offer it, and that as much as we try, we don't feel nurtured by it? My take on what a spiritual path is, what a spiritual, what the word spiritual means, is reintroducing ourselves to our reality, that this, is, that this noble nature, these gems within us, and this relationship we have with God, uh, the creator of all these gifts, <clears throat> uh, it, that allows us to feel connected to this uh, infinite richness of life, anything that allows us to feel that is a spiritual path, and anything that veils us from it is not a spiritual path. So. Baha'u'llah goes on to say that the purpose of the one true God, exalted be his glory, in revealing himself unto men in the various religions, is to lay bare those gems that lay hidden within the mind of their true and inmost selves. So this is the purpose of religion. You know, it gets uh, covered over with all sorts of superstitions and power structures and the very thing that's supposed to unite people and uplift, uh, uplift them is used as a weapon to uh, uh, and a, a, a tool to uh, tout one people over another. All of these are man-made perversions of the real purpose of religion, which is to bring out these gems. Right. And it's the process of bringing out those gems that I feel is one of the things that calms down our anxiety. When, we, when we're doing what we're meant to do in life, anxiety goes away because we're fulfilling our purpose. Right. All right. So there, there's a, a, a couple things I want to talk about now. Uh, there's a dynamic that I've been thinking about lately that I wanted to share with you in regard to something like anxiety. When you speak to someone who uh, is sharing with you their anxieties, they, they usually have a underlying theme of something out in the world that is happening that they're not able to connect to the way they'd hoped. Like this young woman who wanted to be on time for her session this morning, but you know, a blinding rainstorm <laughs> made her three minutes late and she was guilty, felt guilty about that. So there was an external situation that caused her to feel that she wasn't living up to uh, uh, um, you know, what the demands of that situation were. Now with anxiety, what tends to happen is, is we take one situation that we feel that we're not connecting to appropriately that we're, and we generalize it. So in her mind, this one situation where she was late by a few minutes, made her feel completely anxious in her whole being. 
So it wasn't just anxious about being late. It was, I'm the person who's late all the time. I'm this horrible person who can't do things right. I've just messed up my opportunity to get better. We call that generalization, right? And catastrophization, where you take a one little thing and you turn it into everything. Right? And then that leads to more anxiety and a more of a sense of despair that you can't connect with that river of life. So part of the treatment then is to put it into context and say, well, that's just that one little thing. But uh, um, actually, I, I had forgotten to wear my mask. We're still wearing masks in doctor's offices in the in the uh, in the U.S. and I had left. She's my first patient at seven this morning, and I left my mask in the car. And I said, "Well, then you've got to forgive me for wearing a mask, or for not wearing a mask." So we laughed about you know we both messed up a little bit, but the the point being is that there <clears throat> with anxiety there tends to be some sense of of missing out on an opportunity in out in the world. <clears throat> when we have a sense that as a result of that that we are. Um, uh, no good, or that we're not worthy, or that we're not <clears throat> um, uh, 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 that our nature is somehow soiled because of that. That that leads to kind of depressive trends. So this idea about not feeling that we're connecting to the flow of life outside of us and, and uh, leading to anxiety, and uh, the sense that we are not connected to, to life, that trend tends to move towards depression, right? So, and it's the interaction of this, this, this sense of failure in the world and failure within myself gets, becomes reinforced, right? And it's very common then to see people who are um, anxious and depressed at the same time, right? And once, one, one kind of feeds the other, I'm not good enough, so that I'm the person who's three minutes late for the doctor's appointment. I messed up the doctor's life. My life is terrible. My life is terrible. I'll never be good in the world. So, and you go through this kind of back and forth, this in and out. Now, what would be a spiritual approach to something like this? Well, I, I, I think it's really important to help people feel their worth in the flow of life. It's really important to, to do that in a way that's authentic and dem demonstrable, right? Um, so let, let me read a few more things for you. Uh, let's see. Uh, well, okay, I have a couple things down here. I want to point to a prayer of Abdul Baha. Abdul Baha. If you don't know uh, about Abdul Baha, I highly recommend you read up a little bit about his life. I, I'll, I'll tell you one quick story just to tell you uh, in the broadest terms what kind of a human being he was. He was the eldest son of Baha'u'llah and the successor to Baha'u'llah. And um, he is said to have embodied every, every ultimate spiritual ideal. And so he's considered the exemplar uh, of the Baha'i teachings. When he passed away in 1921 in um, Haifa, uh, Israel, it was Palestine at the time, <clears throat> not a single Baha'i eulogized him, not one. But the, the, the head rabbis of Palestine eulogized him, that the mufti of the region of the Muslims eulogized him, several other Muslims eulogized him, the Christian archbishop uh, um, eulogized him. The Christians, Jews, Muslims, and Druze, they're the ones who carried his casket, wept over their, the loss of what they thought was their spiritual leader. Can you imagine that he's the head of another religion, but all these other people saw him as their spiritual guide? That's who Abdul Baha was. So Abdul Baha, there's this wonderful prayer of his where he says something very interesting that I think has some implications for what we're talking about. There's a line in there where he says, he's speaking to God, it's a prayer. He says, give me to drink from the chalice of selflessness. With its robe, clothe me, and in its ocean, immerse me. And I often wondered, why does he say it in two different ways? 
how does selflessness have to do with being clothed in something and then being immersed in an ocean? Give me to drink from the chalice of selflessness with its robe, with the robe of selflessness, clothe me and its ocean, immerse me. <clears throat> and I was thinking about it just this morning in the context of what we're talking about right now, about anxiety and about this movement inward and outward, that <clears throat> we have these notions of who we are, that uh, we become attached to, that we feel are really, well, they're the, they're the reasons we tell ourselves that we're not good enough for God to love us or for us to not be a part of this flow of life that I've been talking about, or this, this the wonders of this munificence. We can look in ourselves and see a million reasons we're not, right? So when Abdu'l-Bahá talks about being clothed with the robe of selflessness, my take on that is that that's part of that flow of life that goes inward, right? It's clothed with the garment of selflessness internally, right? And in its ocean, immerse me. That's when I'm out in the world and I'm looking at the, you know, the beautiful stars and the, the beautiful sunrise and listening to the birds and I'm engaging with other people and out in the world, seeing the wonders of nature and, and working with other people. That's the ocean. In, in that world, in, I, I, I want to be selfless in that infinite external world. So there's an infinite internal world that Baha'u'llah talks about in regard to the wonders of his munificence. And that if we look, if we really knew ourselves, we would know God, right? that, not that we're God, but that, that we have been endowed with these divine qualities, these gems. So, so um, that reality is our internal world, that infinite internal world that when he says, clothe me, uh, with selflessness, we're asking to be released from all of the illusions, all of the what Baha'is sometimes call them vain imaginings, these ideas about who we are in the world that just are just, we made them up. And instead, if we become selfless, we allow ourselves to be open to allow these gems to reveal themselves, right? So the selflessness brings out these divine qualities when we allow it to remove the, the things that we allow to hinder who we really are from being expressed. And if we talk about selflessness helping us uh, in regard to being immersed in an ocean, in, in its ocean, immerse me, it, that's kind of being lost in the, inf the infinite wonder of creation in a way where we feel exalted really. Now, what if you don't know that there is an infinite world inside you that's divine in nature? And what if you don't know that all of creation is made for you and is endowed with infinite grace and, and beauty and, and, and love waiting for you? What if you don't know that? <clears throat> well, then the experience of the self which we yearn to find, we yearn to find that spiritual nature in us because that's why we were created, to find it. But if we don't know that's why we were created, then that yearning feels like anxiety. And if we don't know that the infinite universe is, is impregnated with spiritual grace and infinite knowledge and wisdom and, and loving embrace of us, if we don't know that we're an essential part of the universe, if we don't know that, then when we yearn to be connected to things, we don't know how to do it. And the result is we feel anxious. So my take is, is that maybe fundamentally, it, what anxiety really is, is that, is that yearning to be a part of this infinite in, internal and external grace but not knowing that that's what we're here for. And so that yearning gets confused. And so we, we wind up being confused about whether or not it was a bad thing that I'm three minutes late for my doctor's appointment because it's raining cats and dogs and the Uber was late. Right? So, so, so I'm hoping that makes some sense. So what would be a practice to help us with our, our anxiety? Now, it's not foolproof at every, with every anxiety at all times, but I think it's a life's work to re 
daily, maybe uh, Baha'is are asked twice a day at least to immerse themselves in Baha'u'llah's and Abdul Baha's writings so that we can remember, we can re recall that that's why we're here. We're here to be a part of this infinite beauty in, of creation that's uh, without us and within us, right? It's outside of us and inside of us we, to be, so that we can be robed in the, in the, uh, uh, in, the, in the cloth of selflessness and immersed in the ocean of selflessness so that we can be a part of that wonder, right? <clears throat> so there's a, there's a quote of Baha'u'llah's. He's actually quoting the Quran where um, uh, in the Quran, it says, fear God and nothing else. And that notion of fear, I think is, is, uh, perhaps misunderstood, uh, uh, and maybe there's a better word in Arabic, um, but it, it's the sense of fear that you would be, you would somehow allow yourself to be cut off from that infinite grace within you, or the infinite grace that we're living in. Right? So it's the fear that some act or attitude or neglect on our own part would, um, veil us from the reality of this wonder. And if that happens, he says, then the, uh, then Baha'u'llah says, uh, a, a heart that does that fears nothing. Th th there's nothing to fear, which is an amazing concept. But you've, I, I, hopefully we've all met someone who is able to be calm and peaceful when things are very difficult. And some version of this reality is moving in their hearts. Well, all right. So I think I'll start wrapping up shortly here. But I wanted to just suggest um, uh, that those of you who are investigating the Baha'i faith, perhaps for the first time, or those who are you know, students like me still trying to figure it out, um, to avail yourself of the prayers of Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha because I think they're roadmaps to how we can reconnect to this infinite wonder of our creation that's both within us and everywhere around us. <clears throat> now, just a, one fascinating thing, and then I'm going to, uh, then I'll, I'll be quiet. And I, I say that, but it's probably not true. Um, uh, that one of the wonders of Baha'i gatherings that I've really found to be tremendously exciting is Baha'is are struggling with this idea to try, how do we make these gems come out? How do we bring them out in each other? How do we create community where the, the community isn't about who's in charge and who gets the power and who gets the money, but, but the community is about helping each other unfold these virtues, unfold these gems in a united way. And it, because unity, when we see that we're all involved in the same unfolding process, that the unity of that creates more power to, to grow more, right? So um, I, 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 did I say that well? <clears throat> there, there's a, this idea of, let, let's say uh, you had a, an atom of hydrogen and an atom of oxygen, and you knew everything there was to know about he, uh, hydrogen and everything there was to know about oxygen. Even with all that knowledge, there's no way you could know or predict the properties of water when you put hydrogen and oxygen together. There are emergent properties that, that emerge when the unity of hydrogen and oxygen occur. Something bigger and more wonderful and completely unpredictable happens. And, and this is really the nature of, of chemistry. But it's also true of human nature when, when people gather in ways that are intentionally trying to create unity based on this idea that we have these infinite uh, gems within us in this infinite universe of blessings and graces. And that if we work together in unity to solve problems, to help each other, powers are released, just like there are powers released when hydrogen and oxygen come together. So Baha'is all over the world are, are engaged in this process of exploring what this means and how do we increase the, uh, our knowledge of how to release these gems within us. And that all by itself, over time, 
over perhaps a lifetime can go a long way in helping a person learn how to manage those yearnings that we're calling anxiety, you know, and or how to manage them in ways that are not self-defeating or that don't lead to debilitating or paralyzing depression or to isolating uh, uh, anxiety. Well, friends, I, I've talked longer than I uh, said I would. So I, I think maybe we'll just wrap it. And then if you have any questions, maybe uh, someone could shed some light on something I tried to say. Thank you so much, Dr. Woodall. Quanta is very eager to ask her question. Quanta, go for it. Thank you very much. I um, I really, really appreciated your presentation. It, it touched my heart, my spirit, and I thank you so much. Mm, you. Um, when you were mentioning about the... Um, what, how we uh, find e each other, those qualities. And uh, Baha'u'llah says to each has been given different measure. Mm -hmm. And Native Americans, the natives had companion planting. What mm -hmm. they did was they had corn, one row, and beans, another row, and squash. Mm -hmm. And in my uh, studies, you know, my degrees in environmental studies, there was a man in uh, Mr. Warsaw in Iowa, mm -hmm. and he also did something that he never threw away, like corn husks or anything. He just put it into the ground. So I was thinking, and I made this analogy in one of my papers, that we human beings are also the same way. There are different elements, spiritual qualities in each of us. And if we look at the, you know, just like Hala says, look at the strengths of one another. I may not be as patient as someone. They might be very, very courageous. They might have other wonderful qualities. But when we focus on those beautiful qualities, rather than focus on what is lacking, then every person then become stronger because then we create a community where this community is full of strength because they look at each other's good qualities and enhance those rather than saying well quanta has no patience just or you know, i'm just speaking about myself of course so i was thinking about when you said you know bringing out the gems and those are the gems, actually, our qualities. Like sometimes we say, Firuz Hanum is so, just so gracious. She's so gentle, so loving. And then maybe somebody else have other qualities. I think maybe that's, we call it the companion planting and growing together mm -hmm. by looking at the good things that are in the, in the soil each other's heart. I love everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. For, thank you so much. You see, I have a question. These are the people who join us every week. So maybe you have to join us every month. Mm -hmm. At least every month we see you once. Is this too <laughs> much to ask? I've, um, <clears throat> I think my wife asked me the same question. <laughs> Excuse me, I have a question. A month. <laughs> Friends, could you wait until uh, Dr. Woodall would respond to uh, to Miss Quanta from North Carolina, and then of oh. course, no, I love. I, I oh, thank you. I I I I. I my, I have just a few thoughts. I, I think it's a lovely analogy, and and of course the the beans put the the um, nitrogen in the soil. The uh, uh, so th th there's a whole circle of um, uh, synergy with that sort of planting. Um, yeah, and, and and you know we're at a time where the kind of unity the world needs it's never seen before. 
it's, there is no human example to follow for the kind of unity that's required to heal the planet and to heal human divisions. We've never seen it before. We've seen it at smaller levels. So there's necessarily experimentation, right? And we need to be all infinitely forgiving and kind and patient with each other as we stumble through our understandings of unity and hopefully deepen uh, day by day and year by year our understanding. And it's critically important in that context that we be faithful that we be faithful to the people who we are engaged with day to day, that we, we, we um, stay in the game in our marriages, we, that we, we, we reflect on our own faults before we, and maybe never dwell on the faults of others. We have to completely eliminate from our lives talking about people behind their backs, doing anything that disrupts the unity. Uh, we have to find ways to root these things out of our our, our habits, so that we become more and more able to bring out these wonderful qualities. Um, and you know, the interesting thing is, when you have a quality, you rarely see it yourself, but everybody else does, right? And, and the interesting thing is, if you see a quality in someone else, you have it in you, otherwise you wouldn't recognize it, right? So, it, so there's this interesting kind of paradox, but creating and nurturing a community that's devoted to uh, this kind of unfolding, this kind of transformation is wonderfully exciting. And I, I neglected to talk about the most important ingredient. See, I knew I was going to talk more. And uh, here it is. The, the, it's all about love. It's all about love. It, it, what, however much you love, love more. What, whatever, whatever situation is, is vexing you, find some iota of love to introduce to it. You know, uh, we just had a neighbor write us a kind of a, a scathing letter about our trees. We thought our trees are kind of nice, but they don't like our trees. They want us to cut our trees down. And uh, we don't want to cut our trees. We, we like our trees. <laughs> but anyway, so it was just this dilemma just today. And so, uh, uh, I said, well, let's make them our friends. Let's let's find a way to make them our friends. So let's just, I don't know how we're going to do it yet because they seem kind of angry, but we're going to figure it out. So we're just going to find some way. We're, we're going to throw a, a little hook of love in there. And we're so I invited them over for coffee and we'll see if that goes anywhere. So just introduce love in any form the best you can into ev as many situations as possible. And we'll just keep pushing that wedge forward. The world it was brought into being because of God's love for his creation, right? That's the mystery. For some reason, we think that we're, we're outside of that. For some reason, we've been convinced by this culture or by our own acts or by crazy thinking of one form or another that somehow the love isn't for us. How did that happen? We got to get that out of our heads, right? And maybe the kids can help us with that because they know this, they know this like the, well, they just know it because kids are loving. So, uh, and we need to love like children uh, because they know how to love purely, right? And so as adults, we have to remember that and get back to that. But uh, again, uh, that's another talk, but that's probably the talk I should have given was, was how uh, um, the dynamics of love and what, what is required by love, what love requires of us, and what it, uh, 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 how we nurture it, and how it nurtures us. Um, all right, I'm, I'm just. I, if I keep going, you're you're never going to get to feast, and I'm not going to go to sleep because that's a big topic. So I'll just I'll leave it there, and then hope for, for another question and see if we pick it up again. Can I ask the question now? This is Terry. Okay. Terry, um, Sahla had raised her hand before you. Would you kindly uh, raise I your hand? Wait. I can wait. Uh, okay. Let, let him go. Introduce a bit of love. Thank you. Please go ahead, Terry. We love you. Thank you so much. Uh, I thought I have to put it in the chat <laughs> that I have a question. The question I have, uh, first of all, I want to thank you for um, let us understand exactly what it is and what the anxiety cause. Uh, I mean, what caused the anxiety? 
what I would like to see if you can um, explain it. How, how would you explain the anxiety to where a condition or illness or um, something like that, that it is life-threatening and so a person is going to be anxious over it? How would you, how, how we should reconcile on that? Yeah, <clears throat> critically important question. Um, the body has, uh, well, let, let me just explain the brain really quickly. <laughs> That's like saying, let me explain the universe really quickly. Um, so the brain is, think of it like a lollipop, right? You know, it's got a stem, it's got a chocolatey center, and it's got candy on the outside. The brain is the same way. It has three basic structures, the brain stem, the midbrain, and the cortex, the candy on the outside. The brain stem, and I'm actually answering your question, Terry, and I apologize for taking long to do it, but uh, the brain stem is the part of the brain that does everything that's automatic, all the things you don't have to think about, like your breathing, your, your temperature, your hormone regulation, your uh, uh, you know circulation, your heart rate, all those things, that's all the brainstem, including the fight or flight response that we were talking about before. So <clears throat> the midbrain, the, the middle part of the brain, it does a lot of things, but for our purposes, we'll just say it coordinates memory and emotions. Right? And the outside of the brain, the, the cortex, that controls higher thinking. Hopefully something of what I'm saying comes from my cortex <laughs> and it's actually intelligible. So, so that's the outside of the brain, that's the, that's the cortex. So what happens when there's any kind of a threat to us, whether it's a financial threat or whether it's a political threat or uh, the weather or uh, an illness, any time we perceive threat, the control of the brain switches from the top down where the cortex is doing all the thinking, it, it switches to the other way around where the control of the brain comes from the brain stem and it goes up. So remember all those things we said that are automatic like the fight or flight response? When the fight or flight response kicks in, it will kick in because we perceive a threat like an illness. Maybe I'm gonna die. Maybe I'm gonna be in, impaired in some way. So that's a threat to us, right? So our, our, the control of our brain will flip where the control is now coming from the base of the brain, the brain stem. Now, when that happens, the, the, the brain stem, it's kind of like, um, it's kind of like a fire alarm in a high school or, or a grade school, let's say. There was this guy in my high school named Brendan Egan who kept pulling the fire alarm and they expelled him because he kept pulling the fire alarm. So, but when the fire alarm gets pulled, what do you do? Everybody stands up single, you might be in math class, but you put the pen down, everybody stands up single file out of the, you don't even, you don't even think about it. You just, that's what everybody does. If you're taking a test, you stop doing it. If you're in gym class, everybody, everybody does the same thing. Same thing happens when the, the fight or flight system kicks in. Whatever you're thinking, feeling, or doing gets filtered through this thought, this fight or flight lens, where now everything looks like a threat and we, you need to go into survival mode, right? So when that, when that control of the brain goes to the midbrain, that's the part that controls emotions and memories. So now you'll only think about, uh, or you'll only feel emotions that are fearful or angry right? Because those are the fight or flight emotions, remember? And now you'll only remember things that make you feel frightened or angry. It's kind of, our memories are, are always linked with an emotion. So, so when you have a memory of a, a fearful thing, uh, those two things are filed together in the hippocampus amygdala complex, right? So it's like a file cabinet. So there's a file cabinet for all your uh, angry uh, memories, <clears throat> you know, and that's, or there's a file cabinet for all your hysterical laughing memories. That, and that's why when you're laughing hysterically with your friends, every stupid thing is funny. And you can think of a million other stupid things that are funny. Or if you're angry at someone, then you're pulling open the angry file cabinet of memories. And now all you can think of are all the ways this person 
pisses you off, right? And so, or, or if you're uh, uh, anxious, all you can think of are all the ways you've been anxious in the past. So, so you see how the, that adrenaline makes us feel emotions over and over again and only have memories that make us feel that emotion. And they also, then, then it goes up to the cortex where all we perceive are things that make us more anxious or more angry. So, and what happens, so that's how the brainstem and the fight or flight system controls everything. It takes over, just like the fire alarm in the high school takes over the school and what everybody does. So, when we get sick, you know, when we get a, a significant illness or, or we were, were injured in some way or threatened or attacked in some way, the, that's, that's what happens. The, the control of the brain flips from the cortex down to the brainstem up. And now everything looks scary. And now everything looks a little, and you can all you can think of are things that have made you nervous in the past. And now you start thinking, well, maybe my life's a complete mess because a complete waste, because all I can think of are all the ways I, I didn't do the right thing because I'm anxious all the time, right? You remember all your anxious memories. So that's physically why we get preoccupied with, with uh, anxiety when, when we get uh, ill. But now the good news is that just because you've, now, here's the important thing to remember. Just uh, there's what I call a, a, um, a uh, an exquisite seduction, and what I mean by that is is that once you're once you feel angry at someone, and all you can think about are all the ways they've made you angry, and now uh, everything you see around you are just proof of why you should stay angry. It's an exquisite seduction. That emotion has has seduced you. And now you think that that's reality and you think it's all the reality, right? And so now when you see your wife and you're mad at her, oh boy, have I got my list, right? And then a, an hour later, when you're not mad, you go, oh my God, I, I just totally had that wrong, right? That's because the, 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 the control of the brain flipped from back to where you can think again. And you realize how all of that was just because you were looking through uh, these angry lenses, right? Or these anxious lenses. Once you know that about strong negative emotions, then you can say to yourself, okay, I'm really angry right now. I'm really anxious right now, but this isn't my whole life. And this isn't my whole life with this person I love or, or these people I want to be closer to or this work environment, I'd really like to succeed, right? So we can con we can start re-engaging our cortex or our higher nature to try to quiet that brainstem down, that lower nature down. Now, this is a great value of repetitive prayer and meditation and, and things where we get, it's, it's like paving a, um, like a, a path in the, in, the, in the woods. When you go for a walk, you know, and you, you, the first time you go, you tamp down the leaves. The 10th time you go, you can see where you've been because the leaves are patted down. The hundredth time you go, you've got a path. The 10,000th time you go, there's a highway there. Right? So, so the, the point is, is that the more you practice a sense of poise and calm and that, and this, what we were talking about before with prayer, where we were, we're, 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 we're robe me with the, the, the clothes, the, um, we're asking God mm -hmm. to be robed in the cloth of selflessness, right? Or immersed in the ocean of selflessness. When, when we do that and we start to emotionally experience the beauty and wonder and great peace of that and the reassuring nurturance of that, once we feel that that's really what our birthright is, then really after a while, nothing really upsets us. One story and then I'm gonna be quiet. And that's probably not true, but I'm going to tell you anyway. <clears throat> okay, there's this amazing man named Haji Akund. And one of his uh, descendants lives not too far from where I live right now. Haji Akund was a very uh, well-known Baha'i in the time of Baha'u'llah. And uh, because he was so well-known, and the Baha'is were always the scapegoats for things. If, if something was going wrong with a politician, or a prince or something, they just blame it on the Baha'is, then everybody would be distracted. And then they'd arrest Baha'is and beat them. And, and then the, 
all the, the, the people would forget what they were worried about. So some, whenever there was a bad thing going on, and that was, you know, uh, you know, people were talking about Haji Kun would get dressed in his best clothes because he knew they were going to come and arrest him and beat him. So one of these, one time this happened and they brought him to the same prison, the same dungeon that Baha'u'llah had been thrown in in Tehran, that Sia Chal. This is the worst, probably the worst prison in the world at the time, a, a, a fetid dungeon. It was just beyond description. And for days they were torturing him. And not once did he cry out. In fact, his relatives say he would, they would be torturing from hours. And then he would look up and he'd say, Well, when are you guys going to get started? When, when, when do, come on. <laughs> and so it, it, he was completely at peace with whatever they did with him. You know, I'm sure he didn't like it, but he, his inner peace was never perturbed. So much so that the guards called for the Shah himself and said, you've got to see this guy. We don't understand it. We're the Shah's torturers. We're the best torturers in, in the kingdom. And this guy won't scream. So the Shah came down. And the story is that he came down and he looked around the corner like this, like he was afraid that what's, what's he going to see? And there's Haji Akun in, in chains. And, you know, he's God knows what he must have looked like. And he looked at the Shah and he said, your majesty, I'm not, I, I look, I'm in chains. There's nothing like, I'm not going to hurt you. And so the Shah said, well, of course you're not. I, I'm the Shah. And, and uh, so uh, the, the, the guard said, well, what should we do with him? And the Shah said, well, clean him up and uh, put that uh, drapery behind him and get that new thing they call a camera out and uh, take his picture, which in, the, in those days, in the 1880s, that's a big deal. You're taking a picture of somebody. So that's how impressed they all were. They're going to get a picture of this man who, uh, who all the Shah's torturers couldn't get him. He never was upset, never would, cried out, never looked like anything bad happened to him. And so there's a picture of Haji Akun that it looks kind of odd because he, there he is in stocks. He's sitting there, he looks completely peaceful. And there's this backdrop behind him. You think, what a weird picture this is. Well, they'd been torturing him right behind that backdrop for days. And, there, and he doesn't even look like, he, he's like, okay, now what do you want to do? You know. So all, that story, now, clearly, we don't have to go through tortures necessarily in our lives like that, but there are so many stories like that of, of individuals who are ablaze with love, love for Baha'u'llah, love for God, have, have really felt the power of their connection to these wonderful gems we were just talking about and to the, the wonder of creation, that it's so powerful in them that there's no experience that is not full, filled with grace. And so they're always peaceful. Isn't that amazing? So how do we get that? So I think that's our challenge. How do we, and there's a quote of Baha'u'llah where he says, the, 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 the mission of, and this is a paraphrase, uh, the, the whole duty of man in this day is to receive their share of the flood of grace that God pours forth for them. Wow. It's not to, it's not to believe a particular thing. It's not to, although those are, might be important, but your real mission is to accept a flood of grace that God wants to pour out for you. Holy cow. If you're actually living that and, and finding a way to receive that kind of grace, what could possibly upset you? So I think that's a challenge. Figuring out how to do that would be really something, wouldn't it? And helping each other uh, discover how to get there more easily and to be that for each other, to find some way to be that kind of doorway for another soul, what a gift that would be. And I think, I think, I think the kids get this, and the kids know that that is really their mission, to, to bring that kind of world into existence, and to not let the old people get in the way, you know, not let the old people slow them down. 
I'm an old person, by the way. Thank you, Dr. Woodall. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. for, uh, yes, thank you. Shahla uh, Jun, go for it, please. Yes, thank you so much for that presentation. Truly enjoyed it. Uh, you mentioned a few things that uh, uh, often becomes a part, a part of discussion in our junior youth group. And one of them is this selflessness. And how do we become selfless like Abdul Baha? And we look at the stories of Abdul Baha. And, and we have talked about it and discussed what does the word selfless means? And uh, does it mean I disappear or does it mean that I give up? I for us. And so we have come to the conclusion that the only way uh, we become selfless is when we become part of a community, become a, 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 and, and then we serve together. And when we serve together and become part of the community, uh, we become more selfless and less selfish. And it made me realize that uh, I, I realized that I could give up myself when I had a baby because then I had to share me with, you know, I give myself up for this, the needs of that child. And I think that's what happens in the community, that when you decide that there's no I but us, we become more in tune with each other. And I'm glad that you raised this H2O the idea of the hydrogen and oxygen. I think a community is love and faith. When you mix up love and faith, and somebody drew a, put a little picture in the, in the uh, messages uh, showing a brain and a heart holding mm -hmm. hands. I thought that was really truly what the community is, love and faith coming together and uh, becoming one. Now, at, I don't know if you agree or not, but this idea of selflessness is something that continues throughout one's life. You, you know, you, you have to work at it constantly. Or do you think it's a moment that somebody becomes selfless? Because I have a feeling that this is a day by day work that we have to do. Because um, this, what you just said, for example, the idea of being between husband and wife, I know for a fact that when I loved my sweetheart, he could do nothing that was wrong. And when I was mad at him, he couldn't do anything that was right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, uh, so, and that those emotions are so extreme. Yeah. And then I would say to myself, Shala, chill out. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, find a happy medium. And I think that's, this idea of selflessness is the, something that you fluctuate back and forth. And, and I think Abdul Baha had the ability to control that, had the ability to have gone over the fence. I don't know when we go over the fence. This is the great question, isn't it? Uh, th th this is the, the, the question in life, isn't it? What, no, when do we assert ourselves and when do we acquiesce, right? When is assertion selfless, right? When we, we let go of our fears enough to assert an important point, right? So, and or when do we acquiesce and let go uh, to let something bigger happen? These are constant questions and there's never a complete answer. Uh, and well, again, one of the great values of enduring relationships, whether they're uh, husband, wife, parents and children, siblings, uh, grandparents and kids, you know, or communities. The, 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 my take on selflessness is that it's, uh, if misunderstood, it can be the cause of great trouble. Um, because people who uh, love um, their race, but they don't love any other race, and they're willing to sacrifice to kill somebody, or they're willing to uh, give of themselves their time selflessly to, uh, you know, um, you know, deprive women of their rights, or to, or to, uh, 
or to uh, uh, you know uh, prevent people from voting or something. So people can have an identification with a transcendent idea that's not transcendent enough, right? It it's, might be a racial idea, or a, or or they're willing to sacrifice for their religion, but do it by flying planes into the World Trade Center, right? So so sacrifice, by, so then that raises the question: How wide is the circle, and who's in it, right? And what's really motivating it? My take is is that this practice of the love of the infinite both the infinite outside us and the infinite within us, which things like the writings of Baha'u'llah, you, you can't, if once you're engaged with these writings in a heartfelt way and you're enkindled with the fire of love, uh, it pulls you, right? And it makes you bigger, right? And, and there's, you, you, the, the circle doesn't stop, right? The circle doesn't stop at your country or your race or your religion. It keeps getting bigger. And so at some point you realize I'm not this circle. This circle is way bigger than me, right? And <clears throat> so I, I guess what I would say is, is that <clears throat> the, the fundamental requirement to selflessness is a, a fire of love, the, uh, of the infinite love, not a love for just a country or a race or, or even a religion, um, but an infinite love and let it a consuming love, right? And then what happens necessarily is suffering, right? That, that we are, like what you mentioned raising a child, right? <clears throat> it's not easy to wake up at two in the morning and three in the morning and 3.30 and four and have to get up at six to go to work, right? And do it over and over and over again when you're dizzy with fatigue and, and, and you've got one nerve and your husband's standing on it. Right. And uh, so, but you do it because you love. Right. <clears throat> and uh, so, so uh, love is the critical feature and an infinite love and practicing infinite love and infinite patience with each other as we love because suffering will happen. And, uh, and because your idea of yourself, it will get burned. Right. You thought you're the person who has free time, who wants to write that book or do whatever it is you want to do. No, you don't. You got to take care of your kid who's throwing up at four in the morning and you've got to do it, right? And so you do it because you love them. And so, so the path of love is strewn with pain and it, it's the ego that gets burned, right? And, but, the, but the mother up at four in the morning isn't thinking that she's being selfless. She, it's hard, right? It, but you do it anyway, right? So love doesn't make it necessarily easy. It just makes it something that you can't, not do you must to do it because your love compels you to right so selflessness i think has many many faces you know um uh some you know you meet a saint who, who just is really just the, you know in that infinite love all the time and but i don't know who the, i've you know i've met a few hands of the cause and they seem to be that way but um but i i think it's um the, what the the common quality is a a, a fiery love so kindling the love is really important. And this is, this is where kids can get a, a head start. Learn how to have a, a, a blazing love. If you do that now as a, little, as a young person, then uh, all, the, all the kind of anxieties that trip adults up, all of the things that adults seem to think are big deals won't be a big deal for you. You'll just you'll 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 be you'll be so far advanced in quieting that brainstem down and bringing out those gems, and that um, you'll be a world changer. So it's really important, more than more than even learning things by heart or as that's important, <clears throat> or learning teachings. It's very important. Way more important is is learning how to kindle a blazing fire of love. That's what that's more important. Thank you so much, Dr. Woodall. Before I ask the iPhone to to ask uh, the question, I wanted you to know that uh, the recording uh, will be uploaded on the Baha'is of Oakville. The link is uh, in the chat. I apologize for not sending you uh, 
myself, but I would appreciate it if you want to uh, to have the recording of this, if, if maybe in two or three days, visit that link. Uh, iPhone, I would I don't want to ask you to introduce yourself, but I would appreciate it if you do. That, um, someone has their hand up and we don't see your name, but if you have a question, um, uh, you can unmute yourself. There we go. I, Good. I, is that me? That's you. <laughs> yeah. I'm so sorry. <laughs> That's okay. <clears throat> I'm kind of a computer should, literate at some level, but anyway. Should, my, should, my, we, should we call you I or Miss Phone? No, call me Sue, please. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here tonight to listen to this talk. I'm not a Baha'i, but uh, I do t attend some meetings. But my question was um, to you, uh, Doctor. You had mentioned that um, uh, it's it, it's a natural yearning, not a pathology. Like anxiety is not a pathology. Uh, like I've had anxiety all my all my life, and I've I, I live fear every day. Like I'm full of fears, and uh, so I've gone through a lot of different programs, and now I'm doing a mindful cognitive behavior therapy. But so this yearning is this a spiritual yearning for God, or is it a yearning that that we feel towards things we haven't achieved in life? Well, remember what, uh, thank you for the question. Um, it really grounds it in experience. So I'm grateful for the question. I don't know that it's either or. <clears throat> remember when I said that there are these two tendencies of human nature, one is outward looking and the other is inward looking. And when yes. we feel that we're not connected to the flow of life outside of us, like in, in achievements mm -hmm. and things like that, Mm -hmm. that that yearning gets expressed as anxiety and when okay. it's internal when it goes this way when we feel that we are somehow flawed that within us there is something fundamentally mm -hmm. disconnected from this flow of life you know with with all the self-deprecating thoughts i'm i'm no good i'm a no, no one will ever love me i'll never th those sorts of things uh, uh that tends to lead to depression Right. And mm -hmm. so I think there are two sides of the same coin. Right. Okay. So in that sense, uh, the, the, what is spiritual is um, uh, finding ways to get, feel connected, that, that those <laughs> goals of achievement, for instance, are really s symbols. They're replacements for a deeper yearning, which is that sense of connection. Now, will that resolve anxieties overnight? Sometimes, but yeah, it, it's a process. So uh, I don't want to overstate that there aren't pathologies because I don't know anyone who just so suddenly goes from total anxiety to total peace. Well, you know, sometimes that does happen in certain religious ex spiritual experiences. Yes. But, uh, um, but it, it's not the general rule for most people. Um, although I think it's probably possible. But let me just say a few things. There are some disorders of the brainstem and of the front and of the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex right here mm -hmm. that makes it hard for a person to quiet down the, the brainstem the way we, I was describing. That, it, yes. that it, it's actually a physical uh, impediment. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And there are a couple types of treatment, uh, one of them I do in my office, that I would recommend you look into. Um, okay. It, uh, one of them is called transcranial magnetic stimulation. Transcranial. Transcranial magnetic stimulation. It's abbreviated TMS. If you want to read about it, um, I, 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 okay. I, I know you're not in my town, but but you can look at my website, newtowntms.com, and then it explains about what it is and how it works. But I find that it's phenomenally helpful in quieting down the brainstem enough where that where you can think, you know, and, and you can have a different emotion than just fear all the time. And uh, um, uh, so uh, oftentimes in my practice, 
that's a cornerstone treatment that we then sometimes bring other things in as well. You know, if medications are needed or certain kinds of supplements or um, things like what you're doing with the cognitive behavioral therapy, something else called neurofeedback, which can be very, very interesting and very helpful. Um, uh, there are uh, devices you can buy called vagus nerve stimulators. Um, uh, uh, Vegas, V-A-G-U-S, nerve okay. stimulator. It's a company called Nuvana, N-E-U-V-A-N-A. -A. Uh, Nuvanalife.com has a very interesting device called a Zen device. Is that uh, N, sorry, I apologize, N-U-R, Nirvana? Oh, nu Nuvana, N-E-U-V-A-N-A, -E Nuvanalife.com. So- Nirvana. Yeah, and so this is getting at the physical elements of the brainstem <laughs> when it's when it's just too revved up to easily calm down with breathing exercises and meditation and therapy. Uh, these are these are very effective ways to calm that brainstem down so that you can do the additional work um, to, to to help yourself. But I would suggest that with just some of the things that I mentioned, there's no reason to think that you have to be <laughs> consigned to a life of fear and anxiety. Yes, but I, but, I, but yes, and, and so the, those are some treatments. But now on the other end of like what we're talking about tonight, I would strongly recommend the writings of Abdul Baha and Baha'u'llah, especially their prayers. I, the way I describe it to patients, it's like a table. You know, it, uh, it, it, the more legs you get under that table, the better. So mm -hmm. look, find out about TMS, find out about okay. neurofeedback, do the cognitive behavior treatment. Uh, get on the right medications, say these yes. prayers, get engaged in a community that loves you, you know, uh, do all of those things. And, and it's like 10 legs under the table. Oh, gee, thank you so much. Thank You're you. You're welcome. You're very thank welcome. You. One other quick question. I don't want to take up too much of your time, no, but I, I, I have like a, a, a hyper sensitivity like I have MCS multiple chemical sensitivity and I've been told that my amygdala in my brain is um it's like damaged like damaged in the sense that I I sense like I smell things a thousand times I'm like a dog you know uh and they were telling me that the part of the brain called the amygdala. Yeah, it's not the amygdala, but the, I know what they're saying. But well, it's uh, um, the, uh, did you have a severe infection? Uh, no, I had a severe reaction at one point in 2016. Uh -huh. And that tri triggered that. Oh, I see. Um, uh, so... Uh, and I'm sorry, everybody else, because I, I, I clicked into doctor mode here for a second. But uh, I would suggest you look into a few things. Um, uh, uh, just from what you've said, there's a there's a supplement I'd like you to look into. It's called NAC, N-acetylcysteine. Uh, it, I'll spell it N-A-C-E-T-Y-L. A-C-E. T Y L C Y S T E I N E. Yes. Now you know why people say N A C because who wants to say N A C? Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, the last C Y S the end. C Y S uh -huh. uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll spell it again. Uh, okay. A C E. Yes. T Y L C Y S T E I N E. Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and it's uh, abbreviated you. NAC. Take NAC. at least uh, take at least a thousand to twelve hundred milligrams every day. Any way you can get it in you, uh, oh. uh, twice a day, six hundred milligrams or five hundred milligrams, three times a day, four hundred milligrams. Uh, but uh, that's a very, very uh, important anti uh, um, precursor to the most important an uh, antioxidant in the body. And um, after uh, re uh, drug reactions or significant infections, there can be um, inflammatory processes that uh, cause these sorts of problems. And NAC uh, can help reduce that significantly. Um, I, there's a bunch of clinical questions, I, I imagine. But I, I, John, I say that John, John, 
this is Farooz. I love Farouz, you. There you are. Hi, Farooz. Yes. yes. Thank you. Thank you. Jo You're very welcome. Uh, Dr. Woodall, thank God you. you. I'll look into that. Thank you. Yes, please do. Yeah. Hi, Farooz. Hi, she's a good friend of mine. Mm -hmm. I know her very well. And uh, if you have any idea, you can always email me. Oh, oh okay. Any oh, right, idea sure. about her. Good. It's lovely to see you, John. Lovely. Oh, you as well. Yeah, fantastic. <laughs> oh, I have a question please, please, Dr. Woodall. Please. I I'm wondering what is the source of um, of low self-esteem and uh, uh, self-destructive behavior, and how do you cope with it? <laughs> so it, it, again, you've asked me to uh, to explain the universe, <laughs> but. Uh, uh -huh. It's a it, it's a big question and it's a complex question and there are many kinds of answers depending on many many kind of variables so it's hard to give a specific answer. Low self esteem is another one of those things that uh, um, one of my mentors said something to me that I thought was very helpful. He said that nothing's particularly a pathology as long as it doesn't get stuck, right? So sometimes we need to have a, a low opinion of ourselves because we did something stupid or bad or, or hurtful or, or, uh, or we're, we're, we're calling ourselves to account for something. So we need to be brought down a little bit. Sometimes we need to be humbled. So low self-esteem in that sense is part of a process of self-examination. But when we're kind of stuck there, that where where the only conclusion we come to is always negative. This is one of the things I say to my patients: is that um, if the answer to your question is that you're always bad, that's not that's a that's the pathology that you're stuck because you can't be always bad, you know. So so it's the stuckness. Right? No, so then the question is: how do you get how did you get stuck, and then how do you get unstuck? Right? And it, uh, most times people who um, ha are caught in kind of a loop of repetitive negative thoughts about themselves, um, uh, uh, they remember we talked about emotions and how they, they reinforce memories that reinforce that emotion. If you're, de if you're feeling dejected about being a bad person or not, not worthy of any love or instant, for instance, that's all you'll feel. And you'll only think of memories that reinforce that. So after a while, that, that exquisite seduction sets in where you think this is the truth for me. But what it really is, is just a stuck neural circuit, right? Well, think of it like, um, like a record player in the old days where the vinyl, where the needle would get stuck, you know, and just play the same part of the music. The brain can do that where it gets stuck in just this repeating loop and things like TMS, for instance, help with that. They help get it unstuck, but so does meditation. So does prayer. So does a lot of other things, but the causes are multiple, uh, multiple. And it can be from the way we're raised as a child. It can be from, from kind of, pathological spiritual uh, b beliefs or, or religious beliefs that are um, punitive and, and graceless and unforgiving and merciless and uh, punitive and you know condescending and all of that. And you know, uh, it, it, our culture is horrible with the way it treats women, right? And, and uh, the, 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 the way uh, we imbue into women a sense of inadequacy and um, externality, like their, their value is dependent on all of these crazy externalities. So th there's many, many, many ways that a person can wind up feeling um, uh, inadequate. Um, now, remember what Baha'u'llah said, uh, 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 fear God and nothing else, right? Or again, that sense of be inadequate before the infinite creator, right? That, that's because that's, that's realistic right we're nothing compared to the infinite universe and so in one way that's awesome right it's awe inspiring and terrifying but another way it's infinitely 
blissfully loving and wonderful. It's an exaltation, right? So these emotions, when they're spiritual, tend to be fluid, right? You know, you can feel your infinite, in, your infinite inadequacy, and in the next second, be filled with universal grace, right? So it's a, it, so that's how you know it's spiritual. A lot of times, is that it's moving. It's, but and and how you know that it's that um, it's problematic when it's stuck, when it's all you can think about yourself. So uh, oftentimes, I don't talk to my patient about the thought that they have that they're not worth anything. I talk about the stuckness, right? And that takes the because because it, it's a kind of it's a kind of trap. If you focus on, well, no, you're not a bad person. You're all the, well, they've got a whole thing in the back of their head. You're only talking to them for a few minutes, but they've been ruminating on all the reasons they're worthless for years. <laughs> they've got a whole list of, of rebuttals, right? And so whatever you say, they've got, well, okay, open up file 573 and I'm going to bring out, you know, all the, re right? And so, and you have nothing. So you're actually reinforcing to them that they're worthless, right? So I don't talk about that. We talk about, the, how'd you get stuck in that? Where, where did that, when did you notice that you got stuck in that thought? Right? So the stuckness becomes the issue, not the thought. And I would say it's the same thing for someone who's manic, who feels blissfully all the time. It's the stuckness that's the issue. Does that make sense? Absolutely. It, kind of, it, it changes the, the, the framework and it gives you a different way to approach it, right? Thank it's you. just one technique. There's a lot of ways. But. Thank you so much. Some of the friends were on their way to the feast. They sent me emails asking me, making sure that you come back. I said, <laughs> yes, yes, go for it. Gas is our friend, one of the youth in our community. We welcomed Gas a few years back. Please go ahead, Gas. Thank you. Uh, my question was in terms of, let's say, like I recently went through a breakup and obviously when you go through those emotions you feel like you're worthless or xyz but for me it was not that per se because i knew that i did the best i could within the framework of that relationship but then i had a lot of like fear of future like i don't want to go through this again because i once is like it's like a really painful thing when you have to lose someone you love but like, how do you deal with those, um, or in the spiritual element, how do I not stay in that fearful state of, okay, this might happen again in the future, then maybe I shouldn't even, you know, dabble in that realm, because, like, there's a lot of hurt or whatever. Yeah. Heartbreak's horrible. Heartbreak is hard. Um, uh, and you know what? I, I, your questions are appropriate, you know? Uh, at what point should you re-engage? Maybe you shouldn't for a while. You know, that, that's a legitimate issue. Um, th there's lessons to be learned. You know, how much of what was said about me is true and I have to work on? How much wasn't true, but it still hurts me? And how do I find a way to process that hurt? There's a lot to go through after a breakup. Um, and so it, it's appropriate to give yourself some time to, you know, process all that. I think that's a legitimate issue. And, uh, and there's no race to get back into anything. It's, it's not like a competition. Um, uh, so my take is, is if as long as one brings courage and honesty to their process, you're pretty much guaranteed growth. Right? So just, just be honest with yourself, be kind to, be kind to yourself in being honest, and be and be courageous and and the the first courage is to be honest <clears throat> so uh, another thing i say to my patients is that uh, i think i mentioned it a little earlier that um uh did i'll say do you notice that whenever you say something that you say is true it's always negative about yourself it's you, you only say it's only in your reckoning it can only be true if it's negative about you so how did that happen 
again, that stuckness thing. How did you get stuck in that idea that you can things can only be true about you if they're negative? See, because there's a part of us that can think that I'm trying to be honest with myself and accept the, the worst, right? Because I want to grow. I don't want to be a bad person. Well, that's a virtuous thing to be that kind of courageous in that way. But it can also be a kind of um, setup for self-defeat or, or it, it could be something that gets kind of at that, those spiritual qualities we were talking about before where Baha'u'llah says, you know, if you knew with what wonders of my munificence and bounty, I willed you would trust your soul. You know, if that feels like some kind of, you know, fantasy, there's nothing wonderful in me, then it's kind of easy to come to the conclusion that the only way to be honest with myself is, is to see all the negative. So, but if you see that, no, there are wonders of munificence and there's all these wonderful gems in me, I don't get it a lot of times and I'm kind of in the dark a lot, but there's some good in me as well, then you're not stuck. It, it's the stuckness that is a big issue. So, and if you're, boy, I, I think of the times I've done therapy with people that have come the farthest, the two outstanding qualities they always had were, uh, uh, the courage to be honest. Yeah, I guess like, I guess it's the concept of love that I'm like, of kind of like I fear now. So it's like, I, I understand that logically it makes no sense. Like that's part of life ups and downs, but now it's, it's like, I just, I know my value. I know I did the best I could and I don't have any resentment for the person anymore, but the idea of love and then having that torn apart is like, so like, I just have so much fear and I just don't even want to go towards it. Not because I think I'm worthless or something, but the concept or the idea, I guess, is... Uh... That's a really great place to be. Uh, no, I, I'm telling you, you're in a very important place. Um, uh, um, here's another quote. Love never dwells in a heart possessed by fear. Mm. Wow, isn't that powerful? Love never dwells in a heart possessed by fear. So we're, if we're afraid of love, guess what? Love just grabbed you and it's telling you, you don't have a clue. I'm about to show you what love really is. And it's, my, it, it, th there's a quote from the, the, um, the poet Khalil Gibran talking about love. And he says, um, and think not that you can control the course of love. For love, if it finds you worthy, will direct your course. Huh. So. Love is bigger than us. It's bigger than our concepts of us. And it, it, when, it, when it's painful, it's because we're being asked to be bigger, to become a bigger vessel of love, right? So there's fear involved with that. And, there's, and it's rightfully so, because you, you're asked to be hurt again, possibly, or to be vulnerable mm -hmm. again. Well, guess what? Love has its ways, right? And uh, at some point, love will require, because it wants us to be bigger, it will rip us, you know, to be larger. Right? So that's what I meant while I, that I like where you are right now, because you're right at that cusp where you mm -hmm. recognize the fear, right? Yeah. You're in that perfect spot. I would just say, let love, let love lead right? and, and not, you, not you. Uh, uh, that maybe gets back at a little bit what selflessness means, um, to let go of the idea of the self that can be hurt, right? right? So instead of thinking of yourself as the flute, think of the music that goes through it. Think of the, 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 the breath that makes the, the music. Focus on the breath and the music instead of you as the flute. Right? Interesting. I, I, yeah, uh, but, but don't, don't denigrate the place you're in. I think it's an important place. You, you need to be in that place. Lo love wants you to go this way. And in, in your own time, you will. But, but find some way to feed a heart of love in, in your work, in art, in the dog. You say, just feed love. Feed some version of it that works for you. And just keep doing that. And just see if you can expand it. And then love will guide you or life will guide you. It, it, it'll, it'll happen. 
It's yeah, not like I you agree. sign up. It's not like you sign up for a relationship, right? It's a, right. you know, you just, you know, you're prepared and, and the person arrives you, and you're both ready, right? So d- do the work and, and the, and you and the person will be ready at the right time. Yeah, I agree. Would you also think that a romantic love is unique in its nature? Because when it happened, I used all that energy. I, I made sure not to become like, you know, woe is me. I'm oh look at me, blah, blah, blah. I went to the gym. I did my business. I just kept at it. And it, it's endless fuel, I guess you could say the, the pain, but yeah, it's, 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 um, it's, it's the most unique pain I've ever felt in my life. Like I have love for my hum, like humanity givings acts of service what the romantic love was like okay this is a whole new different style of emotions and like it's it's the most powerful thing i've ever felt in my life so you have to respect that that's important that's important uh uh um so um love's trying to teach you something and make you bigger um it might have to bring you low first you know but the, but it's it, the story doesn't end. It, 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 keep right. going with it. Um, um, there's so many things to say, my friend. So many things to say. But but just from the tone of your voice, you know, I hear both the heartbreak and the vulnerability and uh, the purity of your love. I think it's a wonderful thing. Uh, don't lose the don't lose any of that. Um, it, it will change. It will grow and adapt. Um, let it, let it. Um, and, it and when it's you. time, it's time. It, it, the, things won't stay this way. I hope not. But uh, yeah, I just keep praying to God, and I, I'm sure the rest will handle itself. Yeah, and, and, and uh, these times in our life um, help us assess things that only we can assess, right? You know, maybe sometimes in really good therapy that's going on for a long time, you know, you can get at some of these things, but this will bring up like everything about your life, everything about your things you've loved in the past, you love failures, things that didn't work out the way you'd wanted, loves that weren't there for you, your trust that were violated, all this stuff will come up and they need to, periodically they need to, and you need to visit them so that you see what you really value. And 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 so that you bring more fearlessness to the pain, if that can make sense, that uh, that um, uh, that the, the fear will diminish, and in in an odd way, in a paradoxical way, you can you can feel love and pain at the same time. You know, there's that word poignant, right, in English, mm-hmm. that that means pain and love at the same time, right. Like every yeah. parent feels it when their kid goes off to college, right? That's like one like simple version, but a heartbreak is another one. You know, it, there, there's there's the wonder of the love and the tragedy of the loss at the same time, right? So we we, we become better at complexity and nuance, and that's humbling, and and the humility itself could be the lesson. No, thank you. I don't want to take up too much time, but uh, I'll take that into account. Uh, John, I'm getting these messages that can we have ask him to come every week? <laughs> I, I, I so therapy. We're going to have a group therapy next next time. No, you guys, uh, 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 I, I'm happy to to uh, see you all again at some point. I, I do have to tell you that my, my calendar is nuts. Um, my day starts at seven in the morning with my first patient and it ends around six or seven at night. And and I, and my my poor wife, uh, I, I think she remembers my name, but uh, you know, I, there, there's other things I, I have obligations to. But I, I'm wide open to the thought. I'd love to, and I'd love to hear other people talk too. So, sure, uh, John. May I ask Gibby, our French Canadian friend? She raised her hand, but she wanted to leave uh, to make sure Yaz would have enough time to ask question. Gibby, you know that oh. we want to let you, yeah, come back. Thank you. If there is time. Sure, sure. Thank you, uh, Dr. Will. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, excuse me. Um, after four trips by ambulance to the to the hospital, 
mm-hmm. thinking I had heart problems, heart attack or something, because the symptoms were similar to anxiety. The ambulance people said, have you considered anxiety? The symptoms are the same. So mm-hmm. I said, what is that? <laughs> what is that? Well, I heard the name, but I said, how does that relate to what I'm feeling? So anyway, um, I started uh, observing the triggers. Anytime I would feel anxiety, what triggered it? Or who triggered it? And I, I could make connections with things from my childhood. I could make connections with relationships. So by identifying the triggers, I learned to stop that process of the anxiety getting bigger and bigger and bigger. People were talking to me and I, th- I could feel that I would be triggered. I had a, a sign to say, stop, stop breathing. <laughs> and my mm. friends knew and they stopped. And really the progress that I've made in this, uh, I started the, uh, four or five years ago being mm. taken to the hospital and, and I already, Dr. Whittle, and I've, I've done a lot of work on trauma and mm. different, and, uh, and I, I feel a, a difference. So I can, I could relate to a lot of the things you said this evening. Thank you so much. Mm. I, there isn't much time, but I, I'm very happy that I'm finally, mm. that I know that I have this problem that I've, I, I, my entire life, there were issues and what Farouz talked about when we have low self-esteem. Well, I compensated by being always making 100 on every test. Mm. So I skipped grades and it looked good from the outside, but inside, and I would sabotage every relationship. Mm. So there's too much for, for to handle mm. this evening, but uh, mm. thank you, Farouz, for asking me. Mm to open up the courage to open up is that what you said the courage to thank you these are the these are the real uh hero stories um when people these struggles are very private and no even the people in our own family might not know that we're we struggle in these ways give you that thank you for sharing that that's a very powerful story and I'm very impressed at how much progress you made with your own efforts like that. Good for you. You should be giving one of these talks on how you did that. Um, Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. Because because there's so many people struggling with these issues that, and need tools and need support. Um, uh, so that's a wonderful thing. Um, don't neglect any part of yourself. Don't neglect your physical self. Don't neglect your emotional self, your relational self, your uh, spiritual self. Uh, almost invariably, no one of them is the entire answer, right? It Usually there's some version of all of them that's part of a complete answer. Mm-hmm. And sometimes one is more important than others. Like for instance, we were talking earlier with some forms of anxiety, you know, uh, 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 the spiritual approach is is abs- is very very helpful, but there's a physical problem that needs to be addressed. The thyroid is off, or the or the neural network is stuck, and it needs transcranial magnetic stimulation, or or it needs a vagus nerve stimulator. So you need something like that so that you can actually do the work because the 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 body is too out of out of harmony. So uh, so. Or it might be the other way, that, that there's a fundamental um, uh, notion of one's um, badness or disconnection to the world, where a, you know, a spiritual and or a psychological approach are really critically important. So um, the point is, is don't look for one answer in one area, uh, be, but and be open to multiple answers, uh, at maybe even at the same time. Um, uh, but in our culture in particular, we need much more dynamic notions of what spiritual means, much more dynamic approaches to spirit to the spiritual life, and not just not just espousing beliefs, as important as that is, but a living, vibrant internal life that that is nurturing um, this kind of robe me with the uh, with its. Um, they help me drink from the chalice of selflessness with its robe, clothe me in its ocean, immerse me. Get practiced at feeling what that robe feels like. You know, feel, you know, and really 
luxuriate in the vastness of that ocean, right? And get comfortable and make it visceral, uh, make it a part of your lived experience and not only something that you say you believe in, but a lived experience of, of, of the exquisite relationship that God wants with us. And, and the more we do that, the, it, it turns out that that's even helps our body balance uh, in, in, in the long term can be very healing for the body. And, and our culture has neglected that. Religion has become doctrines and theologies. And, um, and I think that when a Baha'i community, for instance, doesn't work, it's trying to operate like a, like a, like a church, right? It's trying, to, it's trying to like espouse teachings and it's not a vibrant dynamic uh, 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 community of spiritual nurturance, right? Uh, the, the the fire of love isn't being enkindled, and and people don't have the experience of um, uh, that exquisite love, and they don't know what it is. Right? We need to get we need to know what that is, and we need to get good at it, right? and we need to help our kids get good at really good at it. Um, and and they'll they'll save the world if we allow them if we help them do that. The teachings will make sense if they know what an enkindled heart is. Otherwise, it'll just be one, like a history lesson. You know, it'll be just something they learned in high school that they forgot, but they will never forget the love. Wow. How can we go home? Well, I am home, so I don't know about <laughs> you guys. <laughs> That's wonderful. Uh, I think this has been the longest fireside in the past four years. Oh. We are very honored and privileged to have had you, uh, Dr. Woodall. Really, really thank you. Usually uh, from 8.30 on, we have half an hour of devotions. If the friends would like to stay back and say prayers, you are more than welcome. We want you to know that we love you. We appreciate everything you do for our communities, every community, all the young people, all the old people. Thank you so very much. And please keep us in your diary, probably in June. Mm. Merci, bonsoir. Bonsoir. <laughs> well, thank you so much for this lovely opportunity and uh, uh, and, and keeping me on track. Uh, uh, my love to all of you, and I look forward to the next time we can all get together. Thank you so <laughs> much. Mm. All right, all my dears, love you all very much. Shole, hi, I just see you down there. You're hiding. Okay. Mm. Uh, Bruce, thank you so much for the Thank you offer. very much. We appreciate it. Thanks a million. All right. Take good care, my friends. Bye-bye now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this, Hanum. This was a gift, definitely. We are all uplifted. Thank you so much. Thank you. Pina Delphin from Malaysia. Ms. Lim, thank how you. wonderful to see you. Stay you behind. Too. Please stay behind. Let's pray together. It was oh, such sure. It was such an inspiring evening. The, the Graham family, I presume you're somehow connected to Dr. Woodall, if I'm not mistaken. Thank you for being here. We, Thank we were, you. We were on pilgrimage with him. Ah, oh, how lovely. Yes. How lovely. Thank, yes. You. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for this wonderful meeting. Thank you so much. Lovely to be with you all. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Miss. Mr. Prima, don't go away. You've been away. Yes, I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you. <laughs> okay. Thank nice you. To, nice to see Mira and Dave well, Wallane. Hello. Hi. Hi. Hi, Marie. <laughs> we'll have to see you sometime soon. <laughs> yes, I hope so. Bye bye. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful evening. And Frank Wilf, too. Yes. Very nice to see you and Marie Proctor. Boy, I haven't seen you guys in such a long time. Nice, nice beard, Greg. Oh, <laughs> wow. Okay. Oh, Bob, bye bye. Thank you very much. A wonderful gathering, and we learned a lot. Thank you. Wonderful, really. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chi, don't you think that because you brought the Juliet's picture, I don't know 
you're here. Please <laughs> let us see your face. We want you to start. Mr. Chi and Judith, hi, aloha. Hello. I'm sorry, it's later than usual. Do you have to go to work? No, 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 no. no, no. Oh, I was a pensioner. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you for the friends who have stayed behind. Mr. Prima, don't go anywhere. You've been absent for too many weeks. We know we remember these things. So please, Juliet, Mr. Where did you go? The peanut stay for five more minutes. We want you to pray with us. Yes, yeah, please. I'm with you. I'm with you. Okay, fantastic. Frank, stay with us. Oh, yeah. Healing prayer in in Arabic. Perfect. Perfect. And then Mahnas Jun, we will have it in Spanish. So, sure. yes. so Mr. Chi, Juliet, go for it. You are the first one. Delphine Lim, please go ahead. Okay. Hovalo et alebi malaku, bel tafi hazrate, parvadigar, omid barbash, va asma sahebi. Shadide in Jahan, no meet my God. Alhamdulillah, Kudahi, Mehraban Dari, Kitabi, Biharbi, Mar Ost, Vakam Kari, Harmut Tala. Pano hi hati man ast Va mo eri bi kasan Wa be na hayat mehraban Agar bitani khal be abdul baha Chikad mehraban ast Albate Asidate Faraf Vasrur Parvash Namai Vafar Yode Vatuba Bioji Asamon Risani Valalaika Vapahala Po Ain 
I'll say in English. He is God, O thou seeker of the kingdom. Be trustful of God's grace and despair not of this world's bitter vicissitudes. Praise be God that thou hast a kind and loving Lord, who is the healer of every ailing one and caring of every afflicted one. He is the refuge to every orphan and the helper of every helpless one and exceedingly loving. If thou knew how tender Abdul Baha's heart is, thou wouldest from pure joy soar in the atmosphere of heavenly delight and shout to heaven in pure exaltation. Upon thee be the glory of the glories. Abdul Baha. Su nombre es mi curación, oh mi Dios, y el recuerdo de ti es mi remedio. La proximidad a ti es mi esperanza, y el amor por ti es mi compañero. Tu misericordia hacia mí es mi curación, y mi socorro, tanto en este mundo, como el venidero. Tú verdaderamente eres el todo generoso, el que todo lo sabe, el todo sabe. Bajo Healing prayer in Tamil language. Unda namame en ekuna padatum. Umay nine tale en a tisije, umadharigami en a tinampike, nandal pal en midu, umadhikirakami in saidum marumelum en a tichem udavi maho, meyahabe, elam marindavar, sarbanyani, whatever that need he ahabe. Wow. Thank you. Mr. Prima. O oh Lord, we are weak, strengthen us. O oh God, we are ignorant, make us knowing. O oh Lord, we are poor, make us wealthy. O oh God, we are dead, quicken us. O oh Lord, we are humiliation itself. Glorify us in thy kingdom. If thou dost assist us, O oh Lord, we shall become as scintillating stars. If thou dost not assist us, we shall become lower than the earth. O oh Lord, strengthen us. O oh God, confer victory upon us. O oh God, enable us to conquer self and overcome desire. O oh Lord, deliver us from the bondage of the material world. O oh Lord, quicken us through the breath of the Holy Spirit, in order that we may arise to serve Thee, engage in worshipping Thee, and exert ourselves in thy kingdom with the utmost sincerity. O oh God, thou art powerful. O oh God, thou art forgiving. O oh Lord, thou art compassionate. Thank you, Mr. Prima.
oh God, <coughs> educate these children. These children are the plants of thine orchard, the flowers of thy meadow, the roses of thy garden. Let thy rain fall upon them. Let the sun of reality shine upon them with thy love. Let thy breeze refresh them in order that they may be trained, grow and develop and appear in the utmost beauty. Thou art the giver, thou art the compassion. I wonder if Mr. Furugi is going to play some music. Thank you for the asking. Uh, Please. We had few guests at our house. Uh, they left just a few minutes ago. And uh, so, okay, I played the uh, one music that uh, is based on hidden words of Baha'u'llah. Thank you very much. Thanks. I, I I learned lots of things from the John that the, and all the question, beautiful question and very deep question that really add to my knowledge and make me more ponder on this uh, beautiful topic. And I'm hope I'm wishing and hoping that next week also we'll have this gentleman in our Zoom. Thanks anyway. Thank you, Mr. Fururi. Maybe you should come back and see us with your harp more often. I'll do that. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Lim, I want you to know that you surprised the heck of, out of me when you started the prayer of Abu Baha in Farsi. I was shaken to the core. Thank you. How did you get the invitation to join us tonight? He 
Pina, Pina has taught herself Persian and Arabic prayers. I got it from Iraj, uh, Iraj Kamal Abadi in our group. We have a, a group. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. So if I ask Iraj Kamal Abadi to invite you, you will be invited, yes? Thank you. <laughs> yes. yes, I want to make sure you will. Next week, we have a very interesting session with uh, Stephen Phelps. In, and, in, in, in Malaysia. Yes. And uh, her children, of course, used to live in Montreal. They're coming back to Montreal. But she also is an artist. She's an artist. And one year, she came to my children's classes, junior youth group, and taught them to make roses. Mm. How beautiful. And we made hundreds of roses. Oh, and I had them in the middle of the Baha'i Center. And she makes them from everything, from ribbons to tissue paper, to garbage bags, to anything that you can get your hands on. Tina can make beautiful roses. And my children learned to make it and we piled it up. We had a Rizmon celebration and the children give, give them as gift to the, the people at the gatherings. Thanks. She's fabulous. <laughs> I, by the way, Pina the, plays guitar and she sang beautifully. I heard her twice uh, and she sang it very deep from her heart and really touches, touches me. Yes, and yes. Uh, very simple, beautiful guitar and then she has a beautiful, very spiritual voice. Yes, yes, yes. 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 beautiful. I love her. And also, Mr. Nopi plays the sun too. So maybe sometime he will pray Santu. Fantastic, fantastic. Mr. Chi and Juliet are here and they also every single time get up in the morning and make sure that we start with devotion every week. Can you support this fireside? And Mr. Perimal, I'm looking at you too in case you don't see me. Uh, and, and, um, and all of you, uh, and and so probably next week we'll see you again. That's fantastic. That's Mr. T. Julia. Thank you so much. Tina, thank, thank, thank you. Frank, I appreciate you being here. John, thank you, Mr. Perimal. Agay Furuqi Aziz, Mr. Tahir Zade, Roya Jun, Hesam, Simin, Suzan, Simi Khanum, Samimi, and Jiva with that Tamil prayer. Thank you, thank you. So you enriched our hearts in this Rizwan. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Rizwan Mubarak. Thank you. Khayli Manun. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Maybe Namit. Maybe Namit. Maybe Namit. See you next week. I love you. I love you. I love you very much. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I love you. Thank you for your job. Azizam, thank you, Shahla Jun. I'm staying behind to copy the chat for the all the addresses. Thank you so much. Good night. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Thank you so Good. much. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, Mr. Chi. Bye, Juliet. Bye, everyone. Bye, John. Thank you, Jiva, for inviting us well. Jiva is also reminding me every time. <laughs> oh, really? Jiva, Jiva thank yes. Yes. <laughs> thank you, Jiva. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Allah. Allah. Allah.